Well, I don't think they're going to be so strong. All right, look at this. We're going to do this thing right here. Everybody watch up here. Now, don't face the other way with your head down and all this stuff. Pay attention to what we're doing. Uh, I had to do some special tool stuff back when I first started working on some of these really early model E3 cars. They had some a way to get codes out of them. The way you got the codes out of those cars, they had a barometric pressure sensor that had two ports on it, and those, one of those ports was the uh, barometric port for the, and the other one was a map sensor that went to the engine. So you had to put a vacuum hose on the barometric port and pull it down to a certain voltage, and then it would go into a heat <coughs> test. And it would start clicking the chromactor solenoids back and forth, and that's how it gave you the codes. But there was no machine that Ford came out with that would pull those codes. And so I had to go and get a project box from Radio Shack, and I had to hook it up to this little connector over here that was out there for the purpose of outputting the codes, and I'd get the codes that way. So that was one of the first electronic boxes I built. But everybody that's a really good mechanic is going to have a little engineer in them. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm talking about. You're going to build stuff and all that. I had to go find out what was wrong with this Eagle Talon one time that was periodically lighting off the alarm. The control box was a simple receiver that took input from four grounding switches. The hood, the hatch, the door. And so every now and then, for it would just, without warning, it would start going honk, 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 like that. It didn't have a scan tool capability and all, because it was like a 90 model. Exactly. They said, we can't sell this car, brand new. So I built a little project box, four little fuses I put in there that were like a third of an amp, hooked them in each one of those grounding switches, left it that night, whenever that thing happened, it pointed me to the one going out of the hood, and I just ran an overlay and took care of that. But I basically gathered information about which one of the four inputs was there, and then I overlaid it. I didn't go looking for the short. I cut the wire out that I knew was shorted and ran one in a really good manner so it wouldn't destroy the looks of the car. You couldn't even tell I fixed it when I got done, but it didn't happen anymore. So basically, I also built a project box one time when uh, one of the transmission mechanics was over working on a little 4 EAT Asian electronic shift transmission and he had rebuilt it and worked on it really hard and tried to figure out why it wouldn't shift right and all and so we knew which solenoids were supposed to be on and off and when they were supposed to be on and off of that Asian transmission and a lot of these like Nissans and stuff they don't power up the solenoid and ground it they actually ground the solenoid and feed power to it which is a little bit backwards so I built a special box and we hooked it into all the solenoids back probing at the engine controller. And as we watched the pattern of those lights when it was shifting, we found out that it had a bad PCM. See what I mean? But actually it was the box that took it. I also had a box that had a rocker switch on it, a power window switch I built. And if some of these motors on here that did idle speed control and the shock damping and all, they were actually polarity reversal deals. And I would operate it back and forth and with those little box I built to do that with. Anyway, but everybody, these are some of the wrenches I took pictures of in my toolbox this morning. Anybody that's worked on cars very long that is a problem solver, Jonathan, have you been a wrench? Mm -hmm. You bend the wrench, you cut the wrench, you do whatever you got to do. I took that one right there and bend it into that Z shape so that I could get on a brake line. I couldn't get on no other way. This one right here, I don't know why I bent it like that, but I did it. I bent it a couple of times. That one right there, I had it. You'll see box in here, you'll see sockets I braised together, and you'll see stuff that I put to, to solve a particular problem. It's a good idea to have some cheap Chinese wrenches in your toolbox so you don't mind cutting them up. Another thing, you know how aggravating it is to get them oxygen sensors out of some of them 5.4s because it's sticking up the wrong way and you can't get nothing on it? I got a 7 8 wrench and I cut it off about that long and I put a little notch in either side of where I cut it off I and I'll put it up there and get a pry bar on it and break it loose and then screw it on the other refrigerator. I the same and what happened to me was when I was getting ready to leave and come over here to teach, I had to do one of those right at the very end. And those uh, some knothead came along where I was working and I had my stuff on the floor because I worked quickly and stole my little wrench. They knew that I, what I was using that wrench for that I had built it. Somebody come took it. I haven't needed it since I've been here, but the simple fact is having a special tool like that that they don't offer on the tool truck. And other things. Sometimes you can copy one on the tool truck with your own ingenuity. You know what I'm saying? All right. Don't modify any wrench that belongs to somebody else. Don't just cut their wrench and feel like you'd be aight. You know what I'm saying? Because that's not a good way to go. Sure. All right. I got a call from this guy way up north. He was working on an Asian vehicle that wouldn't start. He'd done some drilling and torch work, broken bolt. I told his abuse about this the other day, uh, Justin. Told him to scope the cam and crank sensors because I could tell there was some kind of problem there. He had a scope and chose not to go to the trouble to use it. Worked on it another two or three weeks, maybe a month. Found out that during his torch and drill work, he went back in there and see the broken tooth. You break a tooth off of that thing, 
it's not going to start, or if it does start, it won't run but a second, then it'll stall, because it confuses the engine controller if it doesn't see what it needs there. All right, so the old days, when we were attacking a drivability issue, this is the engine performance day, before the computer's thing that took, uh, became the order of things, the first thing we did was we checked everything to make sure it was like it ought to be. So if you get something that you're working on, that you're trying to figure out why it's not doing like it's supposed to, you got to fix the foundation before you can go up with the house. You know what I mean? What I mean by that is you got to make sure the engine's healthy, which is what we've been fighting with on this. It's been sitting in the barn four years, and it's got one problem or another. You also got to make sure that your ignition components are healthy. You got to make sure your injectors are clean or your carburetor's clean or whatever. You got to make sure all of that stuff is like it's supposed to be. If you got a healthy bottom end, you got on this one he's working on. We got this four-liter Jeep out there. And it was the guy was talking about it making lifter noise, so we got with a dial indicator and we set it on top of the push rods, and he turned it through. It's supposed to have 253 thousandths of lift on each valve, and it wounds up with 90 thousandths on a couple of them, and 150 on one, 200 thousandths on some, and there's only one of them that's anywhere close to where it's supposed to be. So he basically gathered information without spending any money, except the time that he put on it. And I called the guy and I said, "You need a camshaft. You're going to have to have lifters." and all the gaskets, because you can't put a camshaft in one of those without pulling it out of there, especially if you're going to replace the cam bearing. You know what I'm saying? So you, you got to have the motor on a stand. Well, that, but anyway, anyway, you go here, you check the cylinder compression for the same reason. You're basically looking at the cylinder compression to see what do we have here for, for compression? Is it good? Is it bad? Or whatever. What was weird about the one he was working on, that Chevrolet 4.8, when we were first checking the compression, on well, number six, bounced up to 120, and after that, didn't have any compression. And then the compression came back later. It was coming ghost stuff. You know, well, like I say, it's been sitting up for years too. Now we use it a test to rule something out. Now, the end cylinder compression waveforms can be used the same way. Now pay close attention to this. Put your phone away and look what I'm doing here. The red and blue humps are drawn to represent the valve opening. Right? That's what the valves are doing while this waveform is taking. What you're basically doing is you're putting a pressure transducer and a spark plug port, I mean hole of your choice, to whichever cylinder you're measuring, and you're going to spin it over, or actually you can crank it up and let it run because all the other plugs are in there. And you can read this transducer because the scope will capture it so fast. We got a transducer out here. You might notice you got your lobe separation angle is you know 222 crank degrees and then 110 cam degrees and so on and so forth. So basically, your crank's turning twice as fast. All right, this one here is your compression puff, spot puff. That's actually pushing that transducer up. Then it goes down right here. This is right before the intake, I mean, the exhaust valve opens. You notice it's going below the, this line right here is zero. If you draw a line right there, that's zero. When the exhaust valve's open, the atmospheric pressure becomes equal to what's in the cylinder for a brief period of time. And then the intake valve closes. This is your overlap right here. And so what you wind up with is that pressure drops again. During this period of time, you're pulling air in, and then the intake valve closes, and you got another compression stroke. That's how that works. You understand that. You even got a nice little uh, diagram down here about crank rotation and all that, tap it lift, rocker ratio, valve lift, and all that kind of stuff. So this is one that has a problem from the service base. We got this from a, a public domain thing online. Many engine control modules will report the wrong cylinder. If the wrong cylinder is reported, you could waste a lot of time on a cylinder that was no problem at all. Have we had that problem on that truck out there? It tells you this cylinder, it tells you that cylinder, it tells you the other cylinder. I wonder if there's something that can be bounced Yeah, but at the same time, we're sitting here saying, what we're trying to do is surgically figure out what we're going to do to repair this thing. And that thing right there would report this. I mean, we was first. what was the first cylinder we were getting a report seven, on? Seven and eight. Seven and eight. I mean, well, that's what we get now. But before that, we got one that was six or three. Or, six. Yeah, six. Yeah, six. And now they're, they're just moving all over the place. Well, he's discovered on that one doing injector flow testing that some of the injectors aren't supporting any fuel at all. Five and seven. Yeah, five and seven are doing nothing. You're still checking on the other ones. The jury's still out on six and eight. Anyway. Six and eight. I haven't checked eight. Yeah. The misfiring cylinder can, if you know how to do it, be identified with a tailpipe exhaust pressure transducer like the one I got out here to verify whether the PO30X code is accurate or not. On this one, we got a 306. You know, I'm just pulling this out of the air. Because whichever one you're checking, see, this is the same cylinder coming up again, right? 
top dead center, bottom dead center, top dead center, bottom dead center. This one's got a problem. It doesn't look right. This is the way a formal and misfiring cylinder on the car we're talking about. Compare it to a good cylinder on the same engine. See what it was supposed to look like? Remember I told you you're compressing the air and then basically you're going down here on your stroke and you're basically going to go, go low. Then when this opens, it goes atmospheric because there's your zero line right here. And then it goes down for your intake stroke again and then it's compressing. You know, you got to have a transducer to handle that. So basically we're looking at the bad one and we're looking at the good one. Now what do you think about this? This is the exhaust stroke. This is top dead center on the exhaust stroke. Instead of going atmospheric like that, we're building pressure here. Somebody talk to me. What are we seeing here? What's the reason for that? I see his phone shining on his oh. face. He's got it below the table. Maybe we'll put it up on the table so I'll know it's there. That's I know it's on right. the intake stroke, right? Huh? This is the exhaust stroke. This is, well, this is actually, right, at, this is after beginning the exhaust stroke right here. This is after your power stroke right there. See? Right. Top dead center is going down with your power stroke. Well, when you go back down, right there after D to E, that's the piston that's coming down, so it's going to draw air in. It's going to try to, yeah, but at the same time, it can't because what's going on here? Where are the valves right here from right here to right here? So, the valve's closed right here. So you're basically got low pressure there, right? It goes below zero. There's your zero line. It goes below zero. And then this bad engine that's given a problem, it basically just climbs right on up. And you hit top dead center and then it starts going back down again. It falls off again. Well, what in the world would cause that hump right there when it's supposed to look like this with a little turbulence there, but going to zero, it's going above zero. That's really a good idea that you had there. Uh, that wasn't what was wrong with this one, but that's one possibility. Yeah. Well, basically, you're looking, you could probably build a case for some of that. Uh, point A is top dead center. Point B is where the exhaust valve open far enough to establish flow. Uh, the pressure changes direction in point B. See that? It starts to go back up. That's what you're supposed to have there. Now this right here is what that looks like. See, that's, that's how I, I actually laid that over. See that? See where those valves are? See, that right there is the, be, the beginning of the opening of the exhaust valve right there. And this is while it's wide open. Kind of like to go back and forth there so you can see. See how that does? And that's how you, uh, look at that. It looks the same way. See, the diagram looks pretty much just like what you're seeing up there. All right, so notice how the pressure changes. now. The question is what's happening in the bad cellar when the exhaust valve opens the D, the pressure ought to rise rapidly to atmospheric pressure and zero PSI bounce there. Look at that clogged up exhaust port. Clogged up the crud. The cylinder is in a vacuum state when the valve opens and pressure goes above zero as it's rising on the exhaust stroke. Something's wrong with the airflow path of the exhaust. You could have an exhaust camshaft timing issue, exhaust valve is limited. An exhaust runner that's restricted, which was the case on this vehicle. And, all right, this what is was a, that thing going to the EGR? No, that wasn't EGR. That was an exhaust runner. Well, so I actually go to the exhaust pipe. That was actually the exhaust on that cylinder. What, what, what made the stop on that? Typically, if you've got one like that that's been using some oil or like if it's a if it's a V engine and it's got and it has sucked the uh, intake gasket in to where it can pull oil from the crankcase into that cylinder and then it starts burning that oil and it's caking up in there it will do something like that. It's been using some oil or it's got some sort of uh, yeah, course, right. back in the olden days when they used to put olefins in the fuel to keep the injectors clean those olefins would wind up piling up on the intake valves and everywhere else. And they were a bit, they weren't quite so bad to get in the exhaust like that but it was cooking, it was burning oil May have been a, may have been a long term valve stem seal thing. I think that was on a BMW. Anyway, so. All right, now this one right here, the green trace is your end cylinder pressure. Compression, there you see it going down, there's your exhaust starting to open, and you got that. Now this right here, that looks pretty much normal, doesn't it, up here? This is a six cylinder. Right here, the fire in order is one, two, three, four, five, six, which it is on a lot of six cylinder V6 engines. All right, this is intake on three, if they were basically. Uh, getting our, we've got our pressure transducer for the, uh, for to get to read compression in cylinder number three. Okay, that's intake three, and that's exhaust four. It's intake four, exhaust five, intake five, exhaust six. 
This is your exhaust pulse using the sensor you put in the exhaust pipe. This right here is measuring vacuum in the intake. Now what's wrong with that picture? What do you see there? This is a V6. What's wrong with the picture? It is a six cylinder engine. What do you see? You just want, what did you just say? Four. I only saw four of those. I should see one of those here. I should see one of those here. I'm not seeing them there. I'm seeing a flat right there. There's not something there. That one there is flat. That one there is flat. And that one there is flat. We got four that are doing something, and we got three that aren't. At least they're all actually are wrapping around. So basically, what you're looking at is you actually got these right here all together. They'll have three that aren't three. So one way or another, we've got four humps, and we've got four dips in the exhaust. What do you think might be wrong with it? Why would it do that? This is a V6. It is a dual overhead cam. It's got two camshafts on each head. Huh? Somebody just put it together, huh? Well, it's, it's, yeah, they put it together. It's got a belt. It's got a belt. But it's not out of time, huh? Oh, it's, it won't even start. So it's not out of time? Well, yes and no. Screen's been divided into six separate boxes. Right. There you go. Shouldn't there be six intake pulses and six exhaust pulses? We only see four. They, they put the camshafts in there wrong. They swapped the intake and exhaust camshaft. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's compression and stuff on some cylinders, but on other. But what happened was that the intake and exhaust camshaft had been transposed in a waveform was taken with the engine spinning. Only one cylinder was being checked by the compression transducer. That's that right here. So it just wrapped it back around with that. So that was what happened on that one. Being able to track that down, you know. Let me ask you this. On my in three valves, how is that set up? What? In three valves, five, four, three valves, how is that set up? It's set up with a quick. It does. And like on the, well, like on that neon out there. That neon has got four valves per cylinder, but it's got only one camshaft. It's a four cylinder with four valves per cylinder, but only one camshaft. Well, I can tell you it's about 150, 160,000 miles on the cam phasers go out. Yeah. There's a lot of those people now on the cam phasers, the performance people. They got a little wedge shaped thing that goes in the cam phaser and just. That's what we'll put it on. All right. Now then, let's talk a minute about a running compression test. We're running, we're going to get this done so we can get on. Running a dynamic compression test is not used very much. Make you a table like this with your cylinder number, the right number of cylinders, static, idle, and snap. Put those three in there, right? Performance tuners use this. I don't know if Matt does it or not. Uh, do a static compression test and record those readings first. Some of you guys have already done compression tests and you know how to do that. Next, install all the plugs except the cylinder you're testing. Now, you're going to move from one cylinder to the next. Ground that plug wire to keep it from damaging the module or disconnect the cup bolt. Do something. If you ground the spark plug wire instead of letting it jump a hard spark, you're not going to hurt anything. If you just close it up where you ain't got nowhere to jump to, I mean, where you can just jump that bolt anywhere. All right, disconnect. Watch this, guys. Disconnect the injector for the cylinder so that you're not going to be squirting fuel in there. Uh, you're going to put your compression texture in there, and that can be done with a Schrader valve out. But most guys won't ever be leaving it in and burping the gauge every five or six puffs. All right, conversation stop. Start the engine, take an idle reading just above a consistent idle at 1,200 RPM. You're not going to have a, an engine idle at 1,200 normally, but you want this one to idle about 1,200. Record the result. Now from 1,200, snap the throttle to 2,500 and release it really quickly. The reading should rise and you record the results. So here's your static, there's your idle, and when you snap it, it'll go up a little bit. Got it? It's not going to have the same compression running that it had static because the air doesn't have time to get in there. That's what volumetric efficiency is about. Here's one. If number one cylinder snap test reading is lower than the other cylinder, see that? These are all higher. That one's lower. Look, these are the same pretty much. 
These right here, they're within range of each other. Pretty that one there is a little bit low. All right, if the snap read is low, less than 80% of cranking compression, look for air, air intake problems like carbon deposits on intake valve, worn cam lobe, which we got that here, worn valve guides and springs, rocker or push rod problems, shutter valve misposition in the runners of the variable intake runner system. Here's one right here. Cylinder four has a higher than normal snap test reading. You notice that? What do you see? 175. Right here, they look pretty much the same. This, folks, is on the L1 Advanced Engine Performance Test, or it was on mine. I've talked to other people who took the L1 test. They wasn't on theirs. I don't know why they threw it at me. But anyway, you see a table like this, and they're going to say, you've got these readings. What's wrong? Better be ready to take that. You hear me? If the snap measurement's higher, means the air is not leaving the cylinder. Problems on the exhaust side, like we saw earlier. Remember how the pressure went up? If the snap readings are all high, look for exhaust restriction, like a clogged catalytic converter or a muffler, if they're all high. All right, example three, cylinder number two's got a low idle and snap test reading. And cylinder number two, 49. See, it's low on that one. Uh, that one those numbers indicate the cylinder is not holding compression efficiently, bent valve, burnt valves, carbon buildup on valves or seats that are holding the valve open, worn valve guides or springs, so on and so forth. Now, about them there are no starts. Yesterday, somebody got smacked around by a no start. Right? Will the engine spin over normally and have even compression? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or is it going, blah, 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 blah. You, know, you don't want that. All right. Check the battery cable to the starter if it won't spin over good. If the compression is uneven, check for timing belt issues or something like that. Now, this is a no start. You've got to remember that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Do you, uh, Justin, you just sort of rolled over and gave up on that one, you know? Do you hear the fuel pump? It's still sitting out there. It won't start, by the way. I'm waiting for somebody to fix it for Do you hear the fuel pump? If you don't hear the fuel pump, how does it power? You don't know if the computer's powered up or not. Just because you don't hear the fuel pump, you could have a bad fuel pump. You could have a computer that's just not awake and so it doesn't know to turn it on. If you do hear the fuel pump, the computer is at least awake. Does it have fuel pressure? If the pump's running but there's nothing but air in the fuel rail, it may be out of gas. You got me? If the fuel pump's running but there's nothing but air in the fuel rail, like if you run the pump and you mash that little Schrader, if it's got one, it goes pshh. Probably out of gas, no matter what's on the game. You can also measure how much current pump for it. All right. Does it have spark and fuel injector pulse? Did you have spark? Did you have spark and fuel injector pulse? Uh, you didn't check that. That's it. You lost it all the way. You at least know if you have spark and fuel injector pulse, you know it's got a crank signal. Can you hear the pump now? Yeah. He said he didn't have fuel pressure. All right. Okay. Then why don't pull the wire and check all the wire? What? What are you talking about? What do we need to know about getting to the point? It's all about gathering information and determining what's not wrong. Is the battery healthy? Well, we know we got good battery. Sometimes just battery terminal connectors. You remember what I told you about that was rebuilt down in that transmission shop over there? And they, they said they never could get it to work right. The guy rebuilt it and he had it for six weeks. And he took it over and Jimmy cleaned the battery terminals and fixed it. I want him power strokes. You know what I mean? I mean, the guy never even called about checking the battery terminal. You know, but anyway, uh, is the base engine healthy? How does it sound when you're spinning? Is the computer awake? You can tell if the computer's awake. One of the ways you can tell if the computer's awake, I'm going to turn on the key. I'm going to go to the TP sensor. I'm going to see if I see five volts. If I don't see five volts, and I'm going to also go to the injectors, and I'm going to see if those wires on the injectors or the one in the idle air control is powered up. All of them are going to have to power up the injector. If the relay, the relay is getting power, it should be awake. Well, the relay can get power, but not deliver it. Also, if you're not getting ground to the pump, the pump still won't run. Yeah, you got to have power and ground on both of them. Why don't you check the ground? All right. Do we have fuel and sufficient pressure and quantity? I told you about this. There's a guy on a Dodge truck. He said, I filled up my truck and I drove a couple of blocks and it died. And uh, so we got it in here and pumped all the fuel out of it into a can. I wasn't but a quarter of a tank in it. Didn't see an area bit of water in there or nothing. You could smell of that gas. You could check it for alcohol. There was nothing I could see wrong with that gas. It looked like you could pour it in your car and it would go. But what happened was we had a situation where whenever we went to start it, the thing was not starting because it had bad gas. We actually put gas in it 
out of our gas tanker and it fired up and he didn't have any more I don't know what was wrong with that gas. It was weird. I mentioned that in here before, but I wanted to talk about it. Do you have fuel, good fuel pressure at good quantity? We got strong spark and injector operation. We got clean, not foul spark plugs. I don't know the time some people get beat up because they can't get one to start and the spark plugs are. And you also remember that time, I told this story before, Donnie was working on one, he couldn't get it to start, he did everything it needed. It was in time, had good clean spark plugs, had everything. And he said, I just don't know what to do with this thing. It won't start and I can't figure out why. And I said, pull three of the spark plugs out. It was a V6. He pulled three of the plugs out and it fired up. And he said, what the heck did that mean? I said, that means your exhaust has stopped up. <laughs> if your exhaust has stopped up, it ain't going to start, right? Some vehicles won't start with a bad cam sensor. On some of them, you can un like a Nissan Altima, you can unplug the cam sensor and it may start and it may not. So keep that in mind too. It's like a racing star. Yep. So anyway, all right. If your heart's not in it, you'll fail. You ever get started working on something and you say, well, this is not really a car anybody's going to drive and I don't really care if I fix it or not. You know what I mean? If you get that, if you get that notion, you're going to fail. If you're only here because you feel like you have to be and you don't want to be, you'll fail. Remember, performance, attitude, integrity, and dependability. This is an email I got yesterday. I'm a young in the mechanic world and have an extreme love and passion for cars. I go to school, I'm a mechanical engineer, I work at a shop, I watch all your videos. I have to say it's an honor and privilege to be able to watch your session. Believe that. You guys are sitting here going to sleep, and this guy's happy to see him, right? I learned so much and it's appreciated. Your automotive story is surprising. Here's another one. I'm honored. This guy's an experienced mechanic with a lot of ASC certifications too. I'm honored to learn from somebody that not only has got technical knowledge but also personal experience and ability to explain the difference between each and how they apply to each aspect of being an automotive technician. This one guy says, thanks for your videos. I've used them to pass five ASC tests so far. Laid off the coal miner trying to start again. Uh, he's a laid off coal miner. He's trying to change careers. He wants any video. But he's passed five ASC tests already. I couldn't get anybody last semester to even take one. I don't know why. My tool of choice is to pass is eight of mine. In other words, this guy right here that answered this one has actually passed eight tests because he was watching what you guys see every day. Do you smell the roses? You know what I'm saying? I'm giving you something you can chew on. You get me? All right. Or as they say nowadays, you feel me? Okay. All right.